Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so we'll, we'll uh, continue on. Uh, thanks, Rod, for a great first talk. Uh, now we'll move to Barry Sanders. Barry's going to tell us about bounding quantum gate error rate based on reported gate fidelity. Barry. Thanks. thanks. Okay, um, so first I'd like to uh, thank Krista and everybody else for, that have organized this event for the opportunity to be here. It's my first time at Microsoft, and the Faculty Summit I found really great, and I appreciate the chance to talk to to all of you about this work. Um, the uh, work I'm going to talk about here, it's on the archive uh, back in January as it wrestles through referee processes. Um, the idea, the motivation of this work is that, um, as I'm sure many of you know, there have been very big announcements about great progress in fault-tolerant quantum computing. And uh, I, and so last year I was staying at the University of Waterloo on a during my sabbatical, I stayed with my son. He's the first author. And so we just spent all our time trying to figure out how can we take a reported gate performance. You know, if an experimentalist, and they're doing great work. There's no disrespect to them. But if there's some really good reports like 99.99% fidelity gate, and the idea is that that's then sufficient to move on, how can we then make use of that number to try to assess on a rigorous level whether, the, um, whether it is scalable. So it's really the question. And I kind of try to think like an investor. You know, If I have money to invest and somebody announces the gate and they set up a company, should I put my money in the company or not? So this talk is just an exercise in trying to take what's reported and put it into a meaningful quantity with respect to rigorous bounds. Unfortunately, the numbers don't translate into very good numbers. So our work has turned out to be fairly controversial um, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, the numbers that we get, and I'll show you later on, uh, look quite bad. Um, and the second thing is that the numbers are not necessarily tight. So if we get bad numbers, so we try to tell people we're taking good numbers, turning the crank to get numbers that are rigorous. But if the numbers are bad, it doesn't mean the experiment's bad. So I just want to get that across right now, that if somebody reports 99.99% fidelity, and we find that the performance is 99% possible error rate, it doesn't mean that's what the experiment does. But kind of for six months, we've been arguing with people who, um, for one reason or another, don't agree with, don't follow that statement. So that's it. So now I've got your adrenaline going. Um, so and the work is done. So Yuval Sanders, the first author, is a PhD student at the University of Waterloo. Joel Wallman is a postdoc at the University of Waterloo. These are my affiliations for that, so I'll just mention briefly. I'm at the University of Calgary, but I've also got a thousand talent Chanran position at the University of Science and Technology in China, and we got various funding agencies to pay for us to do this. Okay, and then oh, those are the cities I live in, and then on the left you get an idea of the talk. So I'll just keep it simple. I'll, I'll introduce the basic notions. I'll talk about the threshold theorem, which is 20-year-old knowledge, so I think the young people need to hear it possibly the first time, and the old people like me need a refresher. So I'm going to take a bit of time and go through it. Um, then this particular part of the talk, connecting phi to, to p, it's the backslash wp in LaTeX. I don't know how to say it. Um, so I'll just call it p. But the idea is that this is the average gate fidelity that experimentalists report. This is the p that we plug into the fault tolerance theorem. And so the whole talk is just about if somebody tells you this, how do you get that? Now, you can't take this and get that but you can get a bound on that. So given one reported, how do we get the other? And I'll just be a little bit clear. There's another controversy, which I'm not going to delve into in this talk, and it's whether experimentalists are actually reporting this. So the idea is that an experimentalist will do the experiment and get some number. They'll call it the average gate fidelity, which is then reported. So whether the interleave randomized benchmarking or whichever technique they're using represents that number I'm not going to worry about. So if an experimentalist tells me this is the average gate fidelity, I'm just going to believe it. I really don't, but I'm going to believe it for the sake of the talk. Then I'm going to take that belief and translate to a bound here. OK, that's the concept. Now, just to give you the context, 
Um, so in the uh, uh, fault tolerance theorem, the concept is, there's an existential proof, and I'll be clear in a moment, but the ex existential statement is that there exists a threshold on errors, and it could be preparation errors, measurement errors, uh, gate errors, noise in the system, all kinds of errors, but there exists a threshold such that if the performance, and it's a gate error rate threshold, if the performance is better than that threshold value, then there exists a way to make it scalable in the sense that with polynomial overhead, with faulty gates and noise and local noise and all that stuff, there's an efficient way to make the circuit, uh, make, the, make the entire circuit work. The problem, of course, is that um, the proof is existential. So the way that it's approached in practice um, is to try to, uh, uh, often it's tackled numerically, Krista, the chair, did work a number of years ago, and a few others have gone through this. You know, just using numerical techniques to try to find it. A typical approach is to try to then find error correcting codes. So you look for a, an error correcting code, um, and you can establish you, you can establish through error correcting codes that uh, you've met some threshold. That's the idea. Okay, and I've mentioned I belabored the point about uh, the aim of this work, and it's simply taking the average gate fidelity phi. Now, I said, so the idea of the error of the fault tolerant, uh, fault, fault tolerance is that it should really be an error on the set of a universal set of gates. You know, we want to make a quantum computer, it's a universal set of gates. But the way things are reported now, experimentally, is somebody has made a gate and reports it on that gate. So I just want to be a little bit clear. All I'm going to worry about for this is if I'm told that a particular gate has an error rate, we're just going to assess that. But if you want to assess the full computer, you want to look at all the gates and find the worst one and then assess that. So if somebody makes a gate and it's good, it doesn't mean the other gates are good. Okay, now uh, I'll try to make the claim clear. So a lot of the work I'm going to present here is very derivative in the sense that it's using previous results. Um, and in particular, we like the wallman flamia result. I'll tell you a bit more about it. So Joel Wallman is one of the authors of our work. And Steve Flamia is now at the um, University of Sydney. And so they come up with a bound on the worst case quantum, uh, they come up with a bound on the quantum gate error rate. Um, and then all, what we do here is we just prove it's tight in a sense. So we find a couple of examples and show that the bound that they find can't be improved. Now when I say it can't be improved, it's with respect to scaling in terms of the dimension of the gate. So if you have a two qubit gate, you have four dimensional space, three qubit gate, eight dimensional, and so on. So it can't be improved with respect to scaling with the dimension of the gate and, um, uh, and with respect to the scaling in terms of the average fidelity. So our goal is simply to show, ultimately we show a tightness of their scaling. Okay, and then there's some technical details on the threshold theorem and the importance of fault tolerance. Okay, then I'll do it, and I think in this audience a lot of people know circuits better than I do. But I just have a slide showing circuits just to explain a few key notions that will appear on the next slide. So this is a classical circuit. Some of the issues that arise, it's nice to understand it classically first. And so this just represents a circuit. And then we have gates. And gates can include the initial, the final, the fan outs, readouts, and so on. And then if you take that particular circuit and you want to know how big it is, the size of the circuit is the number of gates in the system, including all those points I said. Then there's a gate depth, which is the longest path from a given gate to the output. Um, there's a circuit depth, which is um, the maximum length from the input to the output. And then there's a circuit width, which is the maximum number of gates of given depth. So if the given, if the, you know, if given depth of four has the most uh, uh, number of gates, the width uh, corresponds to it. So there's just classical ways of counting the cost of a circuit, and they become important. Now, what's happened um, is, so we have this uh, fault tolerance theorem. And it's a very important theorem. And actually, if, uh, we've been spending a month digging through trying to get a good statement of it. And so there are different statements of the theorem. And some are very complicated written, and some are too easily written, so they tend to be a bit sloppy. And so I, uh, we kind of use a Goldilocks principle. And so um, the Aharonov and Ben Orr one we find just right. We don't, nothing against any of the others, but this is the one we kind of use now to make sure that we stay on track on what the theorem is. 
and I've put verbatim the statement of the Aronoff and Van Orr theorem. Their theorem actually came out in 1999, but it was finally published in 2008, so I don't know if they had bad referees or they just let it sit or whatever, but, uh, but it's an older result that was known, but it came out, and they refined a bit. Okay, so the statement, just to be clear, is that, um, as I said before, there's a threshold beyond which scalability is achieved. So they talk about the threshold, they write it down with respect to E to naught. Um, the circuit's allowed to execute with some error, so epsilon greater than zero is the allowed error, and we need to talk about the metric for the errors. Um, then they talk about Q as a quantum circuit operating on n input qubits for t time steps using s2 and 1 qubit gates. Then they say there exists a quantum circuit Q prime, and now in a strict sense Q prime is a simulator of Q. So there's a quantum circuit Q prime with, um, and then it talks about the overheads that I've just explained in the previous slide, depth, size, and widths. And so the depth, size, and width scale polylogarithmically with respect to n, that's the number of qubits, and effectively the problem size, s is the number of gates, t is the time, runtime, 1 over epsilon, the inverse of the error. Okay, and they say such that in the presence of local noise of error, now how to define local noise, of course that's a bit of an art, and there's nice work I've seen out recently even making fault tolerance proofs that generalize how local noise has to be. So noise can be local, but not totally local to each qubit or gate, and there's growth allowances, so noise can grow during the process. So even that part's a little bit complicated to try to uh, assess what noise is allowed. But it says that Q prime computes a function which is within epsilon total variation distance from the function computed by Q. So this is the key element here. The total variation distance is a probabilistic quantity, so it's, it's a classical statistic slash probability notion, and this is what they use in the proof. So the total variation distance establishes the ground uh, level or, the, or the, the foundation for a rigorous analysis of the fault tolerance theorem. It's not to say that epsilon could be determined with respect to another distance. And experimentalists using the average gate fidelity, it could be meaningful, but in order to connect with the fault tolerance theorem, we have to be able to make either use a total variation distance or some relative thereof um, or make a new theorem. And I'm all for a new theorem, I just haven't seen one. Okay, now um, just to be clear, Q and Q prime simulate, so I just put down here the notion of simulating. So in some sense it's really that the fault tolerance theorem just says that there, there exists a theorem with faulty things that will simulate efficiently the one that you want. And then the concept of error is actually important. We talk about errors but it's important to get the concept of error right if one wants to then tweak what the, the total variation distance. And so the concept of the error that we use, and we've been talking about this for months amongst ourselves and with other people, but we see that a gate produces an outcome. Classically you hope it's perfect, but in a noisy world or a quantum world it's not. And so the actual uh, measurement outcome sample, uh oh, not plugged in so it goes blank fast. Uh oh, <laughs> so maybe I have to unplug and replug. Pardon me? Your mouse was on the screen, it was the only thing that was. Yeah, I know, it's blank. Yeah, computer's blank, but I'll just get the plug. I should have plugged it in, but now that it's gone blank, I don't know. Yeah, stay there. <laughs> So, I'll just keep, I'll have to wiggle it every few seconds. All right, um, okay, so the idea of the error is you have some error prone thing, it produces a distribution of outputs, and then the question is whether the output that you're producing as a distribution matches the distribution you want to get. And that on a fundamental level is why the total variation distance is used. So the total variation distance is operational, and it, if you define the error in this way, then it's, then it's meaningful. So here's the Here's how the total variation distance works. This is just taken from a standard textbook, Markov chains and mixing times. And so the idea is suppose you have two distributions labeled here mu and nu, then the total variation distance is given by these expressions, but you can see in the picture it's very clear that it's really the difference between um, dis distribution one or distribution two and the area one and the area two tend to are, are equal. 
So it's really that area that is the total variation distance between the two. And operationally, um, there's a way to think about it where if, if I have a device that produces outputs according to distribution uh, nu, and I want you to believe it's mu, then, and I run my box, and, every, and then I throw away events so that I only transmit to you ones that will convince you with mu, there's an operational way to think about it where there's an overhead in throwing away events so that I can lie to you. So I'm, you know, it, it costs me to be a liar, and the worse the distance, the bigger the liar I am. So in that operational sense, it's kind of where the fault tolerance theorem comes in. Now we need to quantify this. So there was uh, beautiful work originally by Kitaev and then um, elaborated much more by uh, John Watrous. And John Watrous's notes on this are standard fare for people working through the quantized version. So the idea is that we need to go from a total variation distance to the quantum version. And the answer turns out to be to use the diamond norm distance. And over here, I've just written the expression where, um, and I've, I've tried to explain it there, but first we talk about a distance between states. And Rod just told us all about what a density matrix is, so I don't need to even discuss what this means. Does and I could, well, it's, I probably agree with you. <laughs> um, OK, so then it's the maximum over all uh, channels uh, or observables in this case. And then it, somehow we can reduce it down to the trace distance. Now what we want to do is to deal with the distance between channels. So we think of each gate that's imperfect, could be perfect, it's a channel. So then the idea of the difference between two distributions becomes a difference between two channels. And the diamond norm is the one where we say, take the channel and take other degrees of freedom that we don't want to touch. So if you're going to execute a gate, you want nothing to happen on the rest of the system. And you want the supremum over k, where k indicates the size of that larger system, acting on the state of all states. And then you take the worst case with respect to all states. So the diamond norm distance has very nice properties. And, uh, the, and um, these relations here were established by Fuchs and Van de Graaff back in the 1990s. And so uh, the concept is that what, what evolves out of this is the total variation distance, or alternatively through the diamond norm. This is the um, way that allows us to think rigorously about fault tolerance. So you, but you get the point then. That in the way that current experiments are reported, it's with recourse to a different measure. And so, um, and, and again, I emphasize, because I've been arguing for months about this, but I emphasize that it's OK to use a different measure as long as it has meaning uh, rigorously with respect to the scalability question. So I'm not against it. But on the other hand, we need to be much more careful about the way that we report. So then this slide is just telling you kind of just a rambling about requirements to be able to uh, report um, or to claim fault tolerant threshold. So the question is then, you know, given an experiment comes out, it reports that it's reached a point of fault tolerance. You know, we've built a C naught gate. Now uh, let's build the next thing, right? Now it's okay. Like in some sense, we should just build the whole damn thing and check if it works. But on the other hand, if the claim is that it works, we need to be careful about what are the assumptions and requirements. So um, one of the things that's that. Uh, is required once we steal, deal, de, don't deal with the total variation distance is we start to simulate error. If we simulate the error, then we have to be very clear on the promises that are made of what are the contributors to the error and make sure that those are all uh, laid out. You know, and this is something I don't see yet in a lot of cases that that the uh, that there are results that say it's fault tolerant because our model um, is agreeing in some respects with experiment. Okay. Um, now, uh, so a valid claim that fault tolerance holds, even, in, even with respect to the theorem, is that noise has to be local. So we really have to know about the noise in the system and be sure that the noise in the system behaves in the way that we want. Um, now, if we wanted to do an, a, a full experimental test that's rigorous, the reason experimentalists don't use this technique is it's just too hard. Because with, in the expression on the previous slide, it shows you that we have a lot of observables and a lot of inputs. You know, if we're going to do a supremum, it could be an uncountably infinite set, but it's going to be large in any case, um, even if we take shortcuts. So it's experimentally difficult. Um, another technique that's used is to numerically evaluate and see if the model is reliable with respect to aspects of the experiment. So can we put faith in the model? The model is subject to a lot of tests. 
and then we hope that it's tractable on a classical computer to be able to establish that. Um, what's happened nowadays is the interleave randomized benchmarking that uses random Clifford operations and assesses that way has become very popular. So there's now a technique that, uh, well, it's been around for a few years, but it enables experimental characterization in a way that is entirely feasible. So I think that if something works well in the experiment, they should use it. It's not like I'm saying, don't use that, go away, do something else. Use that, but let's understand what that really means. So the average gate fidelity, uh, it's kind of interesting. The, the average gate fidelity, I'll, I'll skip some of the stuff, but um, there's a, the concept with the Clifford operations, uh, it, mathematically it can boil down to the following. So I've just got um, the phi g is, the, uh, is a channel a averaged over Haar measure with respect to the states in the system. And dg, so when I write the natural subscript, g natural, um, I'm referring to the perfect gate. So given a perfect gate that's unitary, uh, it would be g on rho. So the g natural is the channel version. It's a unitary channel based on that g. And then we just compose it. So we talk about a discrepancy channel, which is the case that suppose that you took your state, you sent it through a perfect channel, and then you send it back through the channel you've got. If the channel, if the channel you make is perfect, then the discrepancy is, is the unity. Okay, so this is really just convenient because it means we can write a lot of unities. And then mathematically what that average gate fidelity really deals with is in some sense we can construct that C, which is an operator that projects on the state or on the householder reflection with respect to the state. And then there's some averaging over it. And so operationally, uh, instead of taking the randomized benchmarking approach as a, as a, a definition, we can use this and then test whether uh, what they do matches that. And, and again, I said, like, for the moment, we're going to leave that aside. We're just going to believe that the experiments are really doing average gate fidelity. But I just wanted to caveat in there uh, to make you worry about that. OK, now, um, in recently, uh, uh, Joe Emerson's group um, has uh, been playing a key role in trying to connect the gate error rate with the average fidelity. So there was a paper out in FizRev A by Magasin, uh, Gambetta, and Emerson. I think they're both at IBM now. Emerson's at University of Waterloo. And so they got a lower bound on the worst case gate error rate. And Magasin, in his PhD thesis, and to my knowledge, it's not published in any peer-reviewed paper, but I, it's, I believe it's correct anyway. <laughs> well, it was tested by a PhD exam, I suppose. So then there, he also puts in an upper bound there, but the upper bound I don't think was published because it was improved a couple of years later by Joel Wallman, who's a co-author of our work, and Steve Flamie at the University of Sydney. And so they uh, got some constant out of there. So this is the state of the art, um, the lower bound and the upper bound on the worst case gate error rate. And then our goal is, like, we're interested in the question of whether you can do better. And of course, if you can do better, there are two ways to test it. One is to do better. And the other is to find an example that shows that it's tight. So we do the latter. So we show that they've done the best they can, maybe not necessarily with respect to a constant, but with respect to the function, the functional dependence on the dimension d of the gate and the f average fidelity. So the question for clarification, is that all based on the trace distance? Or do people actually compute the diamond distance, which my understanding is much more, much more difficult to compute diamond distance? I think distance. trace distance, but I don't know the proof. All trace distance based? I think. I don't know the proof of theirs. But isn't it an issue that trace distance does not compose when you use it in, inside a bigger protocol, whereas the, the diamond distance would compose? I have to check. So, so how Do you know it? Are you familiar with the proof? Are you? I discussed with Dave Corey in the context of a project, and, we, and he was saying honest reporting should be based on the diamond distance. Yes. And, but it's, co it's hard to compute. You have to solve some no, But I'm asking, I'd have to go back and check that, but do you know their proof? or? No. OK. Well, they, I know some work where people looked at channels which can be simulated efficiently, like Clifford. We have Clifford cross operators. And then you, you um, look at the, the closest channel and try to, to connect the, the, um, the distances. Yeah. So, um, I hope I didn't just break this. No, I forgot to wiggle this thing. Yeah, I'll come back. I'm a, I don't know. I, I'll keep answering the question. Yeah. 
There's a, there's a difference in the scaling with uh, 1 minus phi in both in the upper and lower bounds. It's quadratic. I'm curious if you've got an intuition about which one of those two is tight. Sorry, the difference between, you talk, yeah. these, this constant, which one? No, 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 the, the far right. In the, the upper bounds, it's uh, square root 1 minus phi. Lower bounds, it's 1 minus phi. I'm curious whether you've got an idea which one of those is uh, kind of uh, the optimal scale. Oh, oh, you mean this versus that? Yeah. Yeah, but one's a lower bound, the other's an upper bound. Yeah, it, never mind. You're back on track. I'll, I'll ask later. <laughs> I appreciate you, uh, yeah. Related to Martin, Martin question. So this average gate fidelity, you don't consider any ancilla, right? So it's, it's like the same as using a trace distance. So do you have results when like you apply the gates and you still have part of the states that is untouched? Like it, they call like entanglement fidelity. Okay. Do you know anything about it? Sorry, you're talking about the calculation. You're talking oh, about, the about your average. figure of merit. You have this phi of G. Right, right? but you're asking about the calculation of the phi term? No, the definition. In the phi of G, you just do this average over input states, right? Yeah. But if you want to preserve entanglement with the rest, like, you know, oh, in, yeah, in the yeah. sense of the diamond norm, you yeah. should have some, right, some ancilla that you don't touch, right? You should have, like, the gate X on G and the state X on G and G prime, for example. Yeah. No, do yeah. you, can you handle this or? I, I'm, so I'm not sure why you're asking that. I mean, uh -huh. so you, you were here at the beginning or? That, I don't know. But okay. No, because I think I covered, I tried to cover very carefully the point that we're just taking the average gate fidelity as it's used. Uh -huh. So my talk is not advocating the use of the average gate okay. fidelity. It's taking the average gate fidelity as in the ideal, it's reported in experiment. Uh -huh. And then we're looking to convert it to the diamond norm based gate error rate. Oh, okay. so, so when you ask if we can handle it, I'm not trying in any way to improve average gate fidelity. Okay. What I'm trying to do is to use the um, reported experimental quantity and seeing what it means rigorously with respect to the diamond norm based ah, error okay. in the fault tolerance theorem. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Okay. So thanks for helping me give time to get this lit up again. Uh, I got it plugged in, so I think it'll not do that again. All right. Um, okay, so here's, here's the upshot. We just, first of all, we just plug in the numbers. So it's just kind of straightforward to just take reported numbers. I don't put, we've done various, looked at experiments, superconducting, ion ion trap, et cetera. Um, but instead here, I just want to show you uh, what happens. So if you take, just plug it straightforwardly, and you take a one cubic gate like not, two cubic gate like C not, three cubic gate like control swap or Fredkin. And then if the, that column, the first, the, this column here, if the fidelity is better than, average gate fidelity is better than 99.9%, then the worst case, uh, then the worst case gate error rate's terrible. It means that it succeeds with 7.75%, 14, uh, sorry, failure, 7.75%, 14.2%, and 26.9% uh, of the error rates. Okay, so, um, now, as I, as I warned at the beginning, we're not saying that, you know, if somebody tells us that the average gate fidelity is 99.9 percent, and they make a C naught gate, then the error rate will be 14.2 percent. All we're saying is that's a bound that we can establish. Okay, so one of the sensitivities that's come out in the community is that when we say that, they argue, they say, well, we believe we're doing much better than a 14.2 percent error rate. And then my response is, okay, you know, I, I trust you. Can you explain to me the assumptions that you're making that allow you to do better because we can't do it. And then this is where all the difficulty comes in, is that um, I'm only asking for a clear set of statements that I can follow so that we can tighten our bounds. So I'm trying to make it more mathematical. You know, you tell me what you do and we'll tighten it. I'll show you towards the end that um, we've done the Pauli noise channel. So if it's promised to be Pauli, then we get a better scaling. Okay, um, I think I just repeat myself at the bottom there. Um, and then our claim here is that what we find and what we think is that, um, uh, that, and I'll show you the examples, we find this optimal scaling. And so we believe that those numbers can't be improved without promises on noise. So there needs to be some rigorous level where we're able to, to do something. But the only case we've been able to crack so far is if it's promised to be poly noise. Um, and so far experiments don't even, like they're, they're not proven. People talk about that, but they're not proven. Okay, so the way that we try to do a tight scaling with respect to, uh, with the wallman flamia bound is we find two examples. One is to show, I'll just show you the functional form again. Uh, one is 
that we have the wallman flamia result, and then we want to say, if we hold phi constant, can it scale better with respect to d? Or if we hold d constant, can it scale better with respect to phi? So that's the question that we want to deal with. And so in this case, um, we just find an example. This is a unitary gate, uh, and it's given um, as a diagonal matrix with all ones in the diagonal except an e to the i theta. So this is a multi-controlled phase gate. Um, and then if we wanted it to be locally equivalent to a multi-controlled knot, we would just that theta equal pi on 2. So we go through some basic calculations. We calc and so it's not hard. We go through and get the worst case gate error rate expression. We get the um, 1 minus the average fidelity, which we use the other formula to calculate. And then what we find is that the, uh, in this case, the worst case in the uh, least upper bound is larger than the minimum of these two quantities. So effectively, we're finding uh, the same scaling up, up to a multiplicative constant as what uh, Wallman and Flamia found. So uh, we um, get for fixed D. So we fixed the dimension in that case. And then we just get, and we kind of write it as an inverse because we're using a theta argument, so a lower and upper bound. Um, and theta arguments make sense if uh, quantities uh, get large. So we, this is going to be small, so we just wrote it in the inverse way. So you could write it on top and on top, but strictly we have to turn them over. OK. Um, and then, oh, there's a formal argument. This is, uh, Yuval gave the talk, and Gilles Brassard was there. And Gilles very careful about things. So this is, this is the slide that we keep if Gilles Brassard's ever in the audience to try to make it very clear. OK. Um, now the tight scaling and dimension, we just consider a different gate. So here we have the channel. We have some parameter lambda between 0 and 1. And then we have the identity channel. And the c to the n naught is the multi-controlled naught gate. Um, so it's got n plus 1 qubits. The c to the n naught gate there doesn't represent the unitary gate, but rather the channel, the unitary channel from that gate. And then by straightforward mathematics, we can calculate the worst case error rate. The fidelity, we get this result, and then we find that we get um, tight scaling uh, for fixed D. Is that right? Oh, I think it's, sorry, that's fixed D. That should be for fixed phi. It's a typo there. OK, so those two examples show that the scaling they get are, are tight. We found two examples. Some people object to the examples we find um, because, so here's how the argument goes. They say, uh, well, the examples you find, at least this example, is a unitary operation that is over many, many qubits. Um, this is what, so some people call this a coherent error. It can be called a unitary error. And then, so the argument goes as follows. You know, you're using a case that experimentally we can test for and uh, reject. So there are efforts to put noise in channels. So if you think that your problem is a unitary channel, and you just add a little bit of noise to the system, you kill that. But the logical fallacy is just because we find an example that shows that it's tight doesn't mean if you kill that example, you've proved it's better, right? So this is the argument that we have is really um, just a basic logical argument. You know, you can kill our example, um, but it doesn't change the argument. Sure. A microphone. Can you can just repeat the question. It must be a mic somewhere. Huh. <laughs> so, so your examples are uh, ex essentially testing the asymptotics. You, you're changing the constant. Yes. Um, and this is fine, except when you say that 14% cannot be improved. This is not an asymptotic statement. This is a very Correct. specific numeric statement. Correct. So, so how do you kind of uh, uh, reconcile one or the other? Well, no, so I'm not, yeah, you're right. I mean, what you're saying is, OK, fine. If you make an asymptotic proof that the scaling is good, how can that prove the 14.2%? And uh, if, if our proof doesn't show up to some multiplicative constant, that's correct, yeah. So we're just kind of arguing that the tightness of the scaling asymptotically indicates that. But we're not saying, we're saying that we think that further understanding of noise is required to be able to do better. But you're right, the 14.2% can't be written in stone because the um, 
proof of the tightness doesn't incorporate the constant. And for fixed size, uh, you know, it doesn't prove it. So yeah, your point's correct. But we can't do better. So you know, we're, we're just analyzing as we are, and we're not able to make a, a stronger statement. OK. Um, theta argument. All right. And then finally, uh, we do a test for Pauli channels. So uh, I think people here uh, have a good idea what Pauli channels are, but I'll just mention. So we have the Pauli operators, um, x, y, z, and you can throw in identity. And so uh, then with, so over here, we consider a twirl operation. That's that discrepancy channel. Send it down a perfect channel. Send it back through the one that you actually make in order to keep the math a little bit more elegant. And then what we do is sum over all the Pauli operators, the identity and the x, y, z. And that, that becomes what's known as a twirl operation. And then we calculate from that the worst case gate error rate. And uh, delta, yeah, delta here is the diamond norm distance between dg and the twirl. So the delta here that we introduce is a concept that we think of as Pauliness. So it gives you a diamond norm distance of how far your channel is from the nearest Pauli channel. And that delta, when we calculate the worst case gate error rate as a diamond norm distance between the dg, and the discrepancy channel, and the identity, we find through a triangle inequality that we get the delta term as defined up there plus one half the diamond norm distance of dg twirl minus the identity. And then we can calculate this quantity here, and we get a result there, which you, I hope you can see doesn't have the square roots. So remember up here, we keep having square roots over things. The square roots vanish. So if you're promised that the channel is Pauli, then, um, then the 14.2 percent, et cetera, and I understand you know, it's not we have to be careful in those statements, but essentially the scaling becomes better. So we expect the numbers to be better. Um, and we can plug in the numbers. I don't show a table for that, but the performance is better. It's not something that, uh, with respect to the worst case gate error rate plugged into the fault tolerance theorem, is not wonderful, but it's, uh, uh, but it's certainly better. So the message here is really that by plugging in the, um, by making assumptions about noise, being careful, we can get better bounds. And that's, that's what we do. OK. And then uh, last slide, so I'll conclude. Um, uh, so first of all, we, um, we've gone back to the fault tolerance theorem. We've made sure that we have a good understanding operationally of what it means. Um, we kind of look at it as a, an adversarial approach where somebody is lying about the gate, the overhead to be able to lie. So if you make a faulty quantum computer, it's going to a, a two faulty quantum computer, it might still do all the computation, but you might have to run it more times and delete outputs to make it look like it's doing its job. So we have this very operational way of thinking of what the error is. Um, we also deal with an operational approach to the average gate fidelity to make sure we at least have that understanding of operational definitions of the two quantities we're converting. We um, calculate uh, the um, fidelities and the uh, um, gate error rates with respect to the wallman flamia expression. And we show that that's tight um, in scaling with respect to d for phi fixed and vice versa. We then uh, went through and considered what the way we interpret some of the experimentalist arguments that uh, the way we think about it is they're promising us delta approximate Pauliness of the channel. So this is, I won't mention groups, but this is what once some groups are telling me and I listen for an hour, I am able to condense it down to that line. And then, um, and then what we do is we find a scaling that works in this way. So once they do it, we're able to then take their result and do our conversion. Um, and that we, we think that we could do better if there are better things with noise. But the math in this uh, work is simple. And to do better, I think we have to be better mathematicians, which I'm not. So my collaborators are. Um, and then, uh, and I think that, and then this kind of takes us to the future outlook, and that's that, you know, we're, we, we're getting to a point where there are very optimistic uh, predictions about how well quantum computers are going to perform. We're not saying they're not, so our, our results that look like poor performance doesn't mean they're really performing poorly, it just means it's the best mathematical result we know how to get at this point. And that 
um, there's some work to be done. One is really to get the noise models established and trusted. And then the second is to find ways to convert those quantities that experimentalists find convenient to perform. You know, we don't want to, you don't want to tell them if something works, do something else. You know, if something works, we've got to find a way to be able to take that result and then to convert to something meaningful. Thank you. Yeah, I have one question. So I'm, I guess, a curious sort of reverse question. So suppose, you know, experimentalist has a three qubit system and doing some exp can do like all possible experiments with it, right? So I guess, like, natural question as a mathematician for me to ask actually how good he can learn from, you know, all these kind of experiments to actually um, establish uh, bounds on that quantity, right? <laughs> um, suppose an experimentalist does three qubit like a Toffley gate. Yeah, so, right. so suppose experimentalist has a freedom to do any three qubit experiment, right, on his system, right? Yeah. So h how close he can get to estimating uh, this P, right? Because, you know, I mean, can he, can he do b in principle better than just uh, you know measuring fidelity through like benchmarking and uh, anything else, right? Because is it just like because he he just kind of do doesn't have access to you know is it just kind of a question of you know lack of knowledge from experiment, lack of possible knowledge of from experiment, or is it just a question of not doing right, right experiments? Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, I got it. Well, so right now, I think the way that, like, I, I feel like um, the experimental approach is um, coalescing on, on the optimum, you know, that the technique of, of randomized benchmarking kind of makes sense. You know, if you really want to do things rigorously, you go to an experimentalist and say, you know, um, do this over every input, which is uncountable. And, you know, like, there, there's a set of instructions we might give based on the math that are not possible. So if an experimentalist builds some or any three qubit gate, um, I feel like the way they're doing it, which is trying to do randomized Cliffords and that seems, it seems like a good way to go in that there's time scale limits and practicalities. Is that, you, you seem doubtful. Yeah, I, uh, well, I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, if I were like to try to prove some kind of impossibility result, say, I, I would just say, okay, you know, here's like, so experimentalists can, can, can do this many operations in, in this time, right? For example, or how much you can learn <coughs> from it, right? And, you know, maybe this kind of question I would naturally ask, right? So, so yeah, yeah, right. And then you might do it like instead of a uniform prior. Yeah. You might do a non-uniform prior over mm -hmm. inputs and all that kind of stuff. There might be better ways to do it. But I understand what you're saying. You're saying, given that the experimentalist has, what is the capability? Yeah. And then design, instead of using average gate fidelity, find the best way to report, right? Yeah. Or, you know, even like nice, just prove a bound, right? So because, you know, if you just can prove a bound even without finding this way, right? So maybe this bound will be just pretty close to what you get from fidelity, and you just don't need to search for new ways. You just kind of, okay, here's the best possible we can do, right? Or this is what we get with randomized benchmarking. You know, the differences are actually not that big. So, you know, we can actually kind of establish that we can actually do the best thing, right? I um, agree with everything yeah, you say. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I just kind of you know, curious if you thought about this. Is there another question? Okay, great. So we'll uh, let's thank Barry one more time. <laughs>